The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm just last minute putting a lipstick on. You know, it's one of those kind of crazy mornings, but thrilled to be here. We've got a great show planned for you, great guests that we have planned for you and excited that you guys are all here with us. And uh, so first of all, and I don't know what's going on with my internet, but let's hope that it straightens itself out. Uh, let's welcome you all for being here. Let's tell you that we are live right now. It is Wednesday. I have to think about what day it is. Wednesday, July 13th, uh, 2022. So thrilled that you guys are here. Hope that you guys have questions for me and for your get for your guests that I have, uh, here for you today. We're live right now on a whole bunch of platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of those different sites, Traven's showing them to you. Our fabulous Traven is showing them to you right now. So please feel free to write in, tell us where you're watching from, what questions you have. We love it when you guys are here. We look forward to it. I got to say that um, we're, we're going to miss a couple of live shows after today because I have family coming into town and because it's my 20th wedding anniversary on Friday. And then Saturday is Traven's birthday. So we have to take a couple of days off here, but, um, but we're here today live. And then we are um, going to be here next Tuesday and Thursday with new shows for you. And I, and I think you're going to be live on Wednesday without me. I'm not sure about that. That's a rumor. I'm not sure. Hold on to that thought. But um, we have some programming that you haven't seen before that you're going to be seeing on the other days. So uh, thrilled to be here with you and uh, to be here with a live show. So today's the day. You want to be writing something in, uh, be writing it in today. And we've got an amazing guest for you, a very talented gentleman who wants for more people on the spectrum to be empowered to use their money well. I think this is a great subject. If you have teens and adults on the spectrum, you definitely want to tune in and watch this and, and hear what Alex Camaro has to say about financial success across the spectrum. So, uh, and financial planning across the spectrum, which is the, the name of the organization that he is the head of. So we're going to be getting to him in just a few minutes. Minutes, and I'm excited to have an opportunity to talk with him. He's an amazing gentleman. But uh, before that, we have a couple of things we have to take care of. First of all, uh, I want to let you guys know, if you want to join me, I'm on a little bit of a tear right now. Good morning. Good morning uh, to our Cameron's journey. And uh, I I'm on a little bit of a tear right now because I'm, I'm, I'm on when things happen and nobody raises their hand and says, wait a second, um, it makes me itchy. And so I'm itchy right now about as we see it being canceled very quietly by Amazon. Um, so if you didn't watch as, as we see it on Amazon, I really want to encourage you to go show some support to that show. It, it only had one season and then very quietly, Amazon decided not to renew it. And this is the heartbreak of all heartbreaks to me. Um, because, and I said in my review of it, that it's hard to get through the first two episodes of it because it's hard stuff. It's really, really hard, but it's worthwhile to stick around for it. And I think enough people didn't. And that's, that's a shame because it's really good. If you really, I, I want to urge you, I want to ask you, I want to beg you to watch all the way through to season, to the episode eight, which should have been nominated for an Emmy and wasn't yesterday. And I'm, I'm on a tear about that too. But because I said that if the one young man didn't get an Emmy nomination, that I was going to throw things. And I did. I threw things yesterday. Um, and I'm going to continue to throw things. And I'm, I'm throwing around my words. But uh, here's the thing. 
you need to watch it. I'm, I'm assigning it as a homework for everybody that, and the first two episodes are hard homework, but after that you'll be in love and you'll stick around and watch the whole thing. And then on, on episode eight, you and I will be lifelong friends and you'll write to me and go, Oh, Shannon, I had no idea. I'm just saying, I'm just predicting that that's what's going to happen. So, but here's the problem um, that it isn't renewed. So that's the end right now. It's the end of the story and there will be no more. And this is sad for a whole bunch of reasons. One, because it was really good television that empowered people on the spectrum of all abilities um, and of all, you know, all the different people involved in the conversation, the people on the spectrum more than anybody else, but also people who love people on the spectrum. It empowered us too and gave us room to have our feelings. I'm getting emotional. And I mean, Joe Montana, you know, uh, stop. Um, so good. So, um, but so many of their performances are great, but it also on top of all that, if that wasn't enough of a reason to have a television, have our backing from the autism community on top of that, it completely top to bottom espoused authentic casting. All of the people who are on the spectrum are played by actors on the spectrum, all of them. And not only that, they went three steps further. One, they made sure that there were people on the crew from grips to lighting, whatever. It wasn't exclusively people on the spectrum, but it was a reasonable rep rep representation. A reasonable percentage of the people on the set were individuals on the spectrum. There were individuals consulting on the spectrum. There was ever at every phase of this, there was employment for individuals who are on the autism spectrum. And um, that's, we, we can't let that go, you guys. We can't roll over and play dead on that. We can't afford to say, oh, it's okay to cancel that. We have to step up and say something. It's how I feel. I feel passionately about it. I started posting last week and you guys were like, well, we don't know what to do. And and we were we, we did a tutorial about how to tweet at Amazon for you guys. And that's hard. I like I don't know from Twitter. Uh, Traven had to do it. So I made a, a petition. It's a polite petition. I, I didn't say don't buy anything from Amazon. I'm not saying that. I'm saying let's talk, have a nice conversation with Amazon and say the autism community needs you to do a, a second season on this. So please sign that petition. I can't believe how hard that is. Because um, I'm just saying, please reconsider and give a second season, which is more employment, more representation. And by the way, the other thing that they did was they also cast people who are on the spectrum to play people who aren't on the spectrum. Whoa. Um, Amazon did a good thing. And I guess we didn't praise them enough for it when it happened, but let's please ask them to do a second season. Okay. Now, the other thing that I always like to do at the start of the show is tell you we have lots of experts that are here on the show and that I am not one of them. I am a pony. I'm a parent of a neurodiverse individual, very proud pony. And I want to be here for you. This show is meant to be for that larger autism community that starts with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. Of course, they are our why. We care about what is important to them and we need to be constantly asking each individual, what's important to you? What can we be doing to be good allies to, and we're gonna talk about this in a second, power, because um, that job one, right? Um, but. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we also include in the conversation people who love individuals on the spectrum. That's who I am. Um, so anyway, uh, please suggest some books to read on pairing with a child. Do you mean pairing? Tell me what you mean by that, Mohib. Do you mean like there is a, a psychological term pairing? Is that what you're talking about? Or or being paired with a child, like adopting a child, be a little bit more specific for me and I'll be happy to um, give you some book recommendations. Um, and by the way, that's how you write in and ask your questions. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. We're trying to empower you to, to live your best life and have the people around you who are on the autism spectrum live their best life and to be good allies. Um, and that means sometimes we're, we, I am going to get it wrong. And sometimes you might get it wrong, but then we learn and we do better and we move. Oh, building rapport. Oh, um, wow. Okay. So that's a really, you know what I would recommend? Um, 
Dr. Mary Barbera was on the the show with us a uh, week before last. I would recommend that you watch her show and get her book, which is um, Turning Autism Around. I think that that would be um, a great book. Uh, and then let me think about it, about who else has written about how you connect and build rapport with your kiddos. I'm currently working slowly on a book about playing with our children, how we play with our children. Because I'll tell you, when you watch a good therapist play with your child, it's mind blowing because you go, oh, like I had no idea. And I can tell you one of the tricks that they do is that they include a sensory component that is specific to the child. So some kids, in order to stay focused, they need movement. So therapists do this thing that's called spaghetti arms, where they just take the child's arms and very loosely and lightly, because nobody's trying to hurt anybody here, they go spaghetti arms, and they do this so that their arms go like this, and it helps focus them and center them. And it's almost like a tickle, but for kids who don't like tickles, but need constant proprioceptive is what they call it input. Um, every, so they'll, they'll like do something and they'll, and they'll go, okay, it's time for spaghetti arms. And, and I, it's amazing how with a certain group of kids that is like laser rapport because the kid sees, oh, you get it. I got to have some input here. Um, and you know, amazing. So there's so many tricks to all of that, but I would do Mary Barbera's book. Um, and then, uh, let me think about who else has written things about, we did a show a while ago and I can tell, I don't have any idea what the date was, but we did a show with, um, CJ Miyake, Christopher Miyake and he, about playing with your kids. So, uh, cause they were working on a study that would be a great video to watch. Um, cause he's the best <sighs> blow your mind blessed best at that, uh, and can build rapport with a child, like man, so, so crazily fast. Um, cause he listens with all of his senses and then he sees which sense the kid is like reactive to that they find pleasurable. And, and then he gives them that and it's just <sniffs> like uh, flicking a light switch. Um, but, and I see Mohib that you wrote some technique to improve attention in an autistic child. Absolutely check out Mary Barbera's book about that. But there are lots of things to improve attention, but there's a sensory component. We always want to be mindful of that. But I also want you to watch some of the shows that we've done about diet and um, attention. Because if your child is having a bunch of sugar, if they're having a bunch of artificial colors or flavors, you know, good luck working on that. It's going to be a really uphill battle. And for some kids, impossible. And then for other kids, there's food allergies that if they have access to something that they're having even the most minuscule reaction to, it's going to make it harder for them to learn to focus. And so it becomes an exercise in frustration. I'm trying to focus, but I really can't because my bum itches or my stomach hurts or, uh, you know, I have this, you know, itchy spot between my shoulder blades, right? It, it's just asking too much. Um, in any case, so I want you to watch some of our videos about that. You can, you can put in ADHD and diet and you'll see we have a bunch of videos about that. They've shown that diet really can make a big difference. You got to remove the pesticides too. They're, like if you're having issues with attention, they've already shown that there's a direct correlation to the amount of pesticide in the child's body and their ability to focus. Um, and the more pesticide, the less ability to focus, it's just like, you know there. So, um, and I, I can't share the links while I'm doing this, but we'll, you know, if you write to me, Mohib, we can get those links together for you. So, uh, write to me, Shannon at autism hyphen live.com. Okay. And we will get on that as quick as we can be patient with us. How's that? Okay. So anyway, I was saying, uh, that we have lots of experts on the show. I've got a great one for you today, but please remember 
I'm not an expert. I, like a lot of you, am a person who wants to be a good ally. And the longer I stay, the more I learn, right? Just like you guys. But that doesn't make me an expert. Uh, it makes me somebody who cares deeply about making sure that you get what you need. Yeah. Um, so please be here. I'm sending my love to everybody. And um, we're going to get, because uh, we got to get started here. We're going to start off with something we finally refer to as our jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, nani, nani, are those experts talking about? What does this have to do with us? First, we give you the actual definition. Then I make fun of it. Then we give you a watered down definition. And sometimes, I, sometimes I'm better at, at it than other times, but I try to give you a working definition, something that can help you to go, okay, I think I know what she's talking about and I might know what I need to do about this now, or I might know who to talk to about this now, right? Because um, otherwise the jargon is just overwhelming and I'm not here to overwhelm you. So today's jargon term is visual stereotypy. Ooh, does it, like that's, a, that's impressive. Uh, like I, I feel like that's one of those $10 words as my dad used to say, right? Visual stereotypy. Doesn't it sound like you're an expert when you say that? Uh, so what in the hey, nani, nani does it mean? Let's take a look at what our actual definition is and see if we can make heads nor tails of it, shall we? Visual stereotypy is repetitive and stereo, uh, uh, stereotypic behaviors. Don't you love it when they put the word that was in the the definition, if the you know in the, in the actual phrase in the definition, like oh thank you. If I don't know what stereotypy is, I probably don't know what stereotypic is. Behaviors that are sensory seeking for the visual sense. Well, okay, we got a little bit of information here. It basically said it's visual and it's uh, stereotypic. It um, oh you think because it's visual stereotypy, um, but we got a little morsel of attention or. Um, uh, something that can help us to grab onto it here that it's sensory seeking. Okay. So let's see if we can't water this sucker down and, and make more sense of it here. So what is visual stereotypy? It is looking at lights, looking at items out of the corner of the eye, flapping hands in front of the eyes, etc. It's when, you know, yesterday we talked about stimming wasn't yesterday, it was day before yesterday, Monday, um, was our jargon of the day. And we talked about how it's a coping mechanism that we really shouldn't stigmatize, right? Well, visual stereotypy is a type of that sort of, that, that stim. And we talked about on Monday, it's not necessarily an appropriate, it's what we call um, those kinds of behaviors, but it's not necessarily appropriate because stimming is from self-stimulatory. And for visual stereotypy, it might be for visual stimulation, but it also might be to visually calm somebody down. It might be that they're engaged in visual stereotypy so that they can focus. But again, we want to make sure that we don't stigmatize these things, right? That, um, the truth is, I think that visual stereotypy is a little bit more common. Oh, I don't know if what I'm about to say is true, but I think it's more noticeable. I think that's true in the autism community that, you know, we will see people who engage in visual stereotypy more frequently, noticeably on the spectrum. That doesn't mean that you and I don't. We do. But I think it, it kind of sticks out when somebody who's on the spectrum engages in visual stereotypy. Like my son used to do this thing that, that he would pick something up and he would look at it like this. And sometimes he would look at it above him out of the corner and people would go, what is he doing? And they would immediately stigmatize it and be like, that's weird. Why isn't he looking at it in front of him? Why is he looking at out of the corner of the eye? And we didn't know. Um, we had no idea why. He, well, it was a coping mechanism. You know why? Because his visual muscles didn't focus when he looked at something in the middle. They had a really hard time. He needed to strengthen. I actually had to take him to um, a developmental ophthalmologist to learn this. 
but, and he showed me, he, you know, when they, they do this test and there's like a, uh, a stick that has a, a silver ball and a stick that has a gold ball on it. And, and they go, okay. And your child has to be a certain level of an age and be able to comply enough so that they can test this when he was little, they couldn't. Right. But the doctor was like, you know, look at the gold ball and keep looking at the gold ball while he moved it. Right. And then he does the silver ball and he like has them pass. He does this whole thing with them. Right. But, and he said to me, watch your son's eyes when, because when, when he was looking at it over here, steady Freddie, when he was looking at it here, his eyes were doing this because the muscles were trying to focus. And it, and it wasn't a pair of glasses that he needed. He needed to be doing visual exercises to have those muscles key in. Now, I don't know what that has to do with autism and neither did, did the visual, the, um, the, or, um, what am I trying to say? Developmental, uh, ophthalmologist, but P and I can both tell you that we see that these kinds of problems tend to run through the autism community. It's not a part of the diagnosis, but some of our kids have these kinds of issues. And the reason why I knew to go to the developmental ophthalmologist was because somebody on my team said, Hey, I've seen this before. He's having trouble tying his shoes. And we see that his eyes are wobbling, wobbling a little bit. When you think about if you can't look at something dead on and focus, try tying your shoes. It's not easy. Right. And the doctor said to me, I'm surprised this child can read. And my child did read, but he read better when we did the eye exercises. And there were just exercises that he had to do to strengthen the muscles. Like if you were, you know, um, doing push ups, but for your eyes. Okay. So, but, but my son, you know, for him, this was a coping strategy. I can see it out of the corner of my eye. Other people, it's that they need the visual input. We talked about this on Monday that um, if kids are bored and they don't know who wants, do you want to be bored? I don't want to be bored. And they want visual stimulus, right? We all like visual stimulus. How, you know, do you like to sit with blinders on and watch a movie? No. <laughs> you like visual stimulus too. So our kids will enjoy things like spinners or, um, you know, anything that can make colors, which we talked about for some kids, the hand flapping, this makes colors. And if you're bored, why not make colors? This is you being Picasso, right? So, um, Again, we want to make sure that we don't stigmatize this, we, that we look at it and go, it's a coping strategy. What are we coping with? Are we coping with boredom? Because if we're coping with boredom, we will find that if we give that person something else to do, um, where they're able to visually be stimulated, then they don't do this, right? But other times it's it's a different sensory need. And, and we just have to be mindful about what is the sensory need and then help support the person to be able to get their needs met and to help find them a, a, a more functional way. Like my son could have gone through his whole life looking at things this way. It would have made it really difficult, right? For to do certain tasks, like riding a bike, eh, when you're having to look at things this way, kind of impossible. You're going to steer right into the the ditch, right? Um, so, you know, how can we help support a person? We don't say to them, stop looking it out, out of the corner of your eye. If this is working for you, we're not going to take it away from you, but we're going to build the muscles so that you can look in another way. It's just a way of looking at it. Um, our journey, Cameron's new life says, I never want my son to stop visual stimming. It's his way of enjoying his way to see the world. That's great. But like we talked about on, on Monday, is it preventing him from being able to do certain tasks? Um, they say my son spins and looks at, out of the side of his eyes. Now, I, I won't tell you that my son never looks at anything out of the corner of his eyes, but he doesn't have to do it as a coping mechanism anymore. It's a choice that he does sometimes, but it's not a coping mechanism because he's able to see things directly in front of him. By the way, this is the kind of makeup I use. Uh, <laughs> So I just using all my props. Um, so Amanda says, I just did a post about this on Instagram. My son's turned into a definite coping mechanism. It's very calming. It's, uh, it's toned down, but not so consistent now. Now at 14, it's the object that is now calming to him, but it's drastically changed over the years. 
and and I'm like, you know, raising the roof for you here, Amanda, because I think this is the heart of the matter here. If we take away all of our feelings about, well, that looks odd, that looks weird, and just go, what is happening right there? Is it functional? What's it doing for them? You know, uh, my mom used to say this thing about, is it a choice or a problem? If it's a choice, you know, then then it's then you're able to choose other things. And my mom was all about, I want to give you the ability to learn how to clean your house. Now, once I've given you the knowledge of how to do it, it's your choice if you decide to live in a dirty house. But I don't want you to grow up, leave the house, and not know how to clean your house. I kind of love this sort of thinking because, you know, we don't have to take it away from them. So often people are like, let's get rid of the stereotypy. And I say, no. How about we like look at the individual and say, what do you need? What do you need? And are your needs getting met? And uh, the way your needs are getting met, is it preventing you from getting other needs met? And if it is, how can we help you? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so he has a, uh, our journey, Cameron's new life says he has a ball and a rope and he spins it around like a planet orbit. Nothing wrong with that. As long as he doesn't have to do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because eventually he has to keyboard. Eventually he has to, you know, be writing term papers and, you know, doing all kinds of things. But, you know, um, let's say that he, cause I know he's into space. Let's say that he wants to be an astronomer totally can do that. Right. And there will be times when he will play with gravity and do the rope and, and, and do all of that. But he also has to be able to sit and read a book about astronomy. Right. Um, or be able to stand in the planetarium and give the presentation. And part of that might be the rope, or, you know, it might be that the doing the rope isn't so much about the planet. It's more about the motion. And, you know, I, there are still cowboys that lasso, you know, so maybe that's the thing, but we don't have to take it away, but let's be super, super mindful. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. Moving on to our question of the day. Uh, and I already sort of gave it away a little bit question today that you can be writing in wherever you're watching is what is visually overwhelming to you? Cause I said that we all like visual stimulus, right? And we have visual stimulus that we run to that we like but what's overwhelming to you? Because my point here is it's not the same for everybody. Like I remember the first time that I went to see Star Wars in the movie theater and I'm old enough that I was a teenager when the very first Star Wars movie, I think it was 17, when the first Star Wars movie came out. I know I'm old. Um, and I couldn't handle it. Hated it. Hated it. Made me car sick. It was too much for me. It moved too fast and I couldn't, you know, they went into the, the Death Star and oh my goodness, I had to put my head between my knees. I was car sick. Could not handle it. It was overwhelming to me. Now, as I grew and I learned more about how my car sickness works, 20 years later, I was able to go back and watch all the Star Wars movie and watch it on a television screen. And it was, you know, diminished. It's not like, wah. Um, and I loved it, but I am not somebody you take to that, you know, 3D experience, the, the dome movie. It's too much for me, but my kid loves it. I can't, I can't ride any of the rides at Universal Studios because they're all 3D and, you know, experiential, cannot do it. It's overwhelming to me. My mother, who loved to quilt, was just like her favorite thing in the world to quilt. And she'd always heard about this quilting store. Um, I'm trying to think what the name of that place is in Missouri, where they have all the theaters um, and all the country stars play. And in the middle of this town, Branson, and in the middle of the town, they have this epic quilting store. And nothing would do. My mother was going to take a vacation and she was going to go there. She was going to see Andy Williams perform and she was going to go to the quilting store. And we were all so excited. And I couldn't, I, I, I was like, call me after you go to the quilting store. I want to know how it was. My mother walked into the quilting store, turned around and walked out. And I said, oh no, what happened? She said it was too much. I walked in and she said it was like my brain shorted out. It was just visually too much. Couldn't handle it. Right. Whereas I think I could walk into the quilting store and it wouldn't be too much for me. And my favorite thing, fireworks. And the closer I am, the better. And it's visually 
stimulating to me, but not overwhelming. Other people, overwhelming. So talk to us a little bit about what's overwhelming to you and what's the point of this. It's because we need to understand it's not the same. Our brains don't process visual stuff the same way as our loved ones. And so we can't assume, right? Um, Amanda says he used to spin four objects at a time in his hands uh, by his eyes. It's now only one object and it doesn't have to be in front of his eyes. It can be down by his side. Uh, four wasn't functional, so it's been shaped. Amanda, you are the best. Uh, what's visual overwhelming for Amanda is a messy house. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and our journey, Cameron's new life says a 3D movie is overwhelming for them. And yet there are people who just love it, will pay extra to go to the 3D movie. So we cannot assume anything. What you like may not be what your child likes, right? Um, and so that helps us to move forward looking at what will be good for them. And because we never want to overwhelm anybody right? That's not the ticket. Okay. Moving on. We always have a topic of the week. And of course, our topic this week is about empowering individuals who are on the spectrum. If this is not what we're about, then I challenge us to stop. It, you know, if, if anytime you're not sure, and you know, one of the things that my family did is that when my son was diagnosed, I've said this many times and it's in my book, we made a manifesto. We sat down because we wanted to be intentional about what we were going to do for the next couple of years. At that point, that's what we were thinking. Oh, we got it. This is it. They've said it's going to be a couple of years. Let's be intentional. And we wrote a manifesto and said, here's what's important to us. And, and then we would sometimes go and adjust things on the manifesto and go, you know, now that we're in it, we see that this is more important than this, right? Um, but, but now our manifesto has changed so much because my son is doing so well, but this really is at the top of the list for me, empowering individuals on the spectrum. Because if we're doing something and what I like about having a manifesto and being and living intentionally is that stuff comes up where it's like, should we do this or should we do this? And, and they're both seem to be things that, you know, are matter or important or attractive or whatever. But if you have your priorities someplace and you go, well, wait a second, is it this? And, and I know you guys ask me all the time because you know I'm in love with really good quality ABA and I attribute the things that have gone right in my son's life to the fact that he was empowered by good ABA. And, and I know that for many of you, you're like in that phase where you're not sure if you have it or not. And you ask me a lot of times, how would I know if I have it? This, 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 this. If you see that you or your child is being empowered, then you know you have good quality ABA. If you're not being empowered, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have access to good ABA because it's minute by minute, right? But it does mean you got to advocate. And, and if you're the person who's doing something and you go, wait a second, is this empowering my child or my husband or my you know, my daughter or, you know, my girlfriend, whatever the person that you love on the spectrum is to you, is this empowering them? The way I'm behaving, is it empowering them or is it limiting them? And, and if you, if you're not sure it's time to slow your roll and investigate. And if you're a hundred percent sure that it's not empowering them, it's time to stop and reevaluate. This is everything under the sun to me empowering individuals on the spectrum. Okay. Moving on. Uh, yep. And you're making your own. I see that. Uh, and I appreciate that because sometimes you have to do that. So all about empowering individuals on the spectrum are, we're welcoming our guest to the show for the first time, Andrew Komarau, and he's going to tell me if I'm saying his name wrong. Um, but this is a gentleman that I can't wait to hear from because He's going to talk to us about financial stuff and empowering individuals on the spectrum financially. I know. Like, isn't it exciting? He is the founder of Planning Across the Spectrum, and he specializes in helping um, any self-advocating client or family with autism and intellectual disabilities. He's a passionate advocate 
for autism awareness in his community. He is a certified financial planner. He is a certified neurodiversity professional. That's a CNP, you guys, and I'd never heard of that before. Uh, he has always worked toward helping his clients gain financial security now and in their future. And um, putting those two things together, he launched planning across the spectrum. Uh, so, and he says very eloquently that he understands the difficulty and stigma that many individuals with special needs face. And um, he's going to talk to us specifically about receiving himself, receiving an autism spectrum disorder as an adult. And um, so welcome, Andrew. There's so much more that I could say about him and he has, he's illustrious, let's say that. Um, but Andrew, welcome to Autism Live. Thank you for having me. So thrilled to have you here. So I don't know where to start, um, but I, I, I think where we should start is a, about this idea of planning because people get all worried about planning and lots of people go, oh, but you know, what if this, what if that? And so you have some really important words to say to us about how important it is to plan, but to be flexible. Talk to us about that, Alex. And yeah, by the way, did so, I say your name right, Alex? No, but nobody does. I think in the beginning, <laughs> well, you did, I think, call me Alex the first time 20 oh my minutes gosh, ago. I, so and I just did Andrew that. Second. And I just did no, that. No, 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 so Andrew, I'm so sorry. Uh, bubblehead, allergies. Uh, forgive me, Andrew, but how do you say your last name? No, so it, it's Camaro or so I think. Camaro. So, okay. Well, if you yep. think, then that's how it is. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So um, why is it important to plan? Well, if you don't do, make a plan, then one will be made for you, right? Mm -hmm. And that's usually not, you know, the default option that most people want is you know, by default, what the state or what somebody else would choose to do. Right. So. Yeah. And, but you always say that it's important to be flexible with planning. So for the people, and, and let's be clear. So your clients are either self-advocates um, that are on the spectrum or special needs that are advocating for themselves or the family advocating for that individual. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. We work with both. There's uh, 10 people at our company, several financial planners, including me, parents, individuals like myself, the whole spectrum, uh, pun intended. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, you know, I'm sure I'm, you and I had a conversation about a week and a half ago about this. And I said, Oh, I need this probably more than anybody else because I get nervous around money. And so that tends to be the thing that makes me not want to plan because I get nervous about it. And I'm afraid I'm going to be pigeonholed into something I can't do, or you know, there's going to be something that happens and I'm not going to be prepared for it. So I do nothing, which actually creates that. But talk to us a little bit about like what, you know, how we can overcome that and plan, but be flexible. Well, so I think it's important for what you're trying to plan for and at what stage you are. So if, you know, if you, you, or again, a child has somebody who's, you know, younger, that's very different than, you know, later, it can be very overwhelming. You don't need to do everything all at once. You can take small, meaningful steps, you know, in the right direction. And the good news is, if you work with somebody, you know, who's non-judgmental and, you know, which, which you should always work with somebody who's non-judgmental, um, it, it's, you can feel a lot of relief. What I find is that um, most of the time our clients are better off than they think they might be, right? Um, our job is to think of the worst possible case scenarios and help plan for them. So, um, I'm anxious and worried all the time, but now I get paid to do that for you. So, but it's also, there's usually simple things that people can do to really improve their situation. And, you know, the sense of relief that our clients have, you know, knowing that, you know, things will be okay and, and not just okay, but also the reasons why, yeah. um, are really helpful. And that doesn't okay. mean they need to do everything that we recommend. But it's good to have a different perspective. Okay, let's stop for a second and talk a little bit about 
um, your company and, and what you guys do and why you decided to do this? So our company works with parents, individuals, employers, helps, again, financial planning. What is financial planning? Who knows? It depends who you're talking to. What it means to us is we look at everything, taxes, insurance, investments, retirement, but also the government benefits, the state benefits, and even more than that, you know, communities, areas of support, what the individual likes to do, what they're good at. And how can, you know, help them and do that and look at all of those things together and figure out what is the best way to accomplish your goals and the goals of you. And if you're a parent of, you know, your loved one as well, and taking a look at planning for both generations, both lives. And so why particularly did, was this your area of interest, Andrew? What, what made you create this? It's so, awesome. so I always love money. I always love, you know, the, you know, the cash register, the tag sale, um, always growing up. I wanted to buy stock for my bar mitzvah money. And when I was 21, my uncle half joking said they'd hire anyone who would fog a mirror, which I mean, you're alive, um, <laughs> at, at an insurance company. And I'm like, oh, well, they hire me. That sounds good. And so I got my start. I worked for them for a while before going out on my own. And I always knew I wanted to work with people who were like me. I liked solving really complex problems. I liked the really analytical people, like the engineers and the, you know, many people didn't like working with. And I always thought I wanted to work with people more like me. And then when I was diagnosed, I, I like, oh, this makes sense. You know, now I can work with, you know, um, a population that, you know, thinks like me that, you know, that I enjoy working with and also, you know, for better, or for worse, very complex, right? I really enjoy the, the problem solving and not simply doing that for extremely wealthy individuals. Um, so very rewarding as well. And, and one of the things that I want to be clear about is that, um, so the company is called planning across the spectrum Correct. and, and, you know, we're talking today more about what what kinds of things to do with older like teens and adults um but there are people at your company that if people have younger kids and want to learn about what they should be doing for their younger kids and teaching their younger kids you have people at your organization that are skilled for that as well yeah and, and i'll mention that really quick and this is something we spoke about because i said well you know i have to it, we do a lot of work with that. They're just very different situations and scenarios. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we do work with the entire spectrum as an adult myself. You know, I prefer to work for the parents that are older and the adults. I'll say when it comes to, and we have lots of clients where they have children who are three, four or five, 15, you know, it's very different. The most important thing I can say is the flexibility that you mentioned earlier or um, is even more important. You don't know how an individual is going to turn out to be, whether they have autism or not, when they're 5, 10, 18. Yeah. So it's really important to not, you know, it, I'm almost giving an excuse not to worry and almost not to plan a little bit. Don't go overboard. You know, if you have some life insurance through work and some term, don't spend a crazy amount of money on, permanent or whole life insurance from Northwestern Mass Mutual. I, I'll say that, uh, you know, because you also don't know, will the individual need a trust? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe they will. Yeah. And sometimes there's some more severe abilities uh, or sorry, um, they need more support. Mm -hmm. And, but that is one of the things that we notice is a lot of times when we're talking to parents under, you know, 18, it's, it's all the other stuff that you talk about. And it's the school system. It's, helping them be them their best selves to set them up financially um, in a good and a bad way. There isn't too much you can or should do for an individual, you know, under the age of 18 that, that you wouldn't want to do for anyone who isn't, you know, neurotypical. Um, of course there's exceptions, but a generalization yeah. I'm comfortable making. There you go. You're off the but hook. I 
But I, but I love that you're a full service organization and no matter what age the, the individual is that is, um, you know, special needs or on the spectrum or unique needs, whatever language people like to use, you, you have somebody in your organization that can help support them and, or their loved ones that are concerned about them financially. Um, but, but particularly you and I are going to be talking about the age range that where they're a little bit older, they're teenagers or they're adults and they might be, this is a particular interest to me. I have a 19 year old who identifies as being neurodiverse. And just the thing that you were talking about, Andrew, because when he was five, what people were telling me that his life was going to look like is not what his life looks like. Looks like he is in college and working two jobs and has more money in his savings account than I do. And he's better with his money than, than I am. And I have run out of I have no advice for him. He's more advising me. But I would like to see him potentially, you know, spend some time with somebody like you to learn things that I don't know. Um, so what, what would that look like? Cause if you have a client who's 19, who comes to you, do you, do you just, what is, what do you do? Do you set up a meeting to talk to him? What would it look like? No 19 year olds come to us. They're, they're, they're too busy wanting to do, you know, other things. <laughs> um, <laughs> He but, might, he might, so because uh, he's like you. He thinks he's like he wants to have money and he wants his money to grow. Um, so, so I, so again, for somebody like that, and and by the way, it's a you know, like in a good way, like you recognize that a lot of times what we see is um, not as positive, right? You know, the parents saying at eighteen, yeah. nineteen, they can't manage their own money, they can't make yes. good decisions, and. I'm like, what 18, 19 year old makes good decision? Except yours, I guess, right? No, no, no. But I'm not saying he makes good decisions. <laughs> I'm just saying he works hard enough that he has okay, the yes. money to go buy things that I go, why did you buy that? Yeah. Um, you know, so anyway, I, and I'm no bastion of good, uh, you know, uh, good behavior either. So I'm not saying yeah. a good example. Um, but yes, so there, but, but, let's just say a 19 year old in general, whether it's somebody who's already working and has money in savings or a 19 year old, maybe that isn't, isn't employed now, although we hope everyone has the opportunity to work in some way um, in their lifespan. But what, what does it look like? So does the parents then usually are the ones who call you? Yeah, I would say, I would say most of the time, and this is neurotypical or not just most, I mean, there are exceptions we love talking to the exceptions who are interested in this and give them some pointers. And um, a, a lot of times, you know, too, there's a lot of questions on government benefits when somebody turns, you know, 18. Yes. And even if the individual can work, um, we really encourage, you know, if they, we think they're, they might need support to apply. I was on SSI, SSDI, Medicare, Medicaid. It's much harder to get than they are to lose. So, and many times um, the health insurance, what's once that's received for applying for SSI is never taken away. They'll always be eligible or in, in a lot of circumstances. And that's how a lot of supports provided. What we see is the individual can maybe work a little bit and they never applied for benefits. So then at 30, they're trying to say why they've been disabled their entire lives. And that's yeah. when it's really hard when there's a good, when they can work and receive benefits at the same time. And that's a lot of the work that we do is yes, you can apply. No, it doesn't mean you can't work. And here are the reasons why. And it's a really confusing system, but that's what we try to, we try to encourage people to not be held back but get everything they're entitled to. Absolutely. And one of the things that you guys um, talk about are ABLE accounts and special needs trusts. Talk to yep. us about that. My brain just goes zzz when I hear these things. So tell us what we need to know. So ABLE accounts are a savings account for people with a disability. Anyone who has autism is qualified because the disability had to occur prior to 26. You are born mm -hmm. with it. An ABLE account is similar to a college savings account. It's called a 529 or 529A. And it can be used to protect 
assets from, you know, these asset tests where the government says you can only have $2,000 in your name can also be a a way to empower the individual to save money, to spend money, to invest, to have a checking account, to have similar to a, you know, a Roth IRA or a tax-free retirement, but it can be used for anything that is called a qualified disability expense, which I'll, I'll say is essentially anything you can think of because it's anything that would be helpful to the individual with the disability. And when it comes to autism, what would your son want to buy that you couldn't argue is good for his mental health, right? Right. Um, so it's extremely flexible. Um, so, And that's something where we get a lot of questions and we speak a lot. I was an ABLE ambassador for the year 2020, helping promote ABLE accounts. Um, so we do that around the country. They're a really great you know, tool to be able to, for an individual to save, to invest tax-free, and to spend money as well. Okay. So for instance, when my son was applying for financial aid and he had to declare how much was in his savings account, that got counted against him for financial aid. But if it had been an enable account, it might not have? Correct. Correct. Yeah, those are excluded from the FAFSA. So that would be actually a great example where even if he wasn't on government benefits, where you could put it in um, the ABLE account. Yep. And yet he could use that money to pay his tuition. He could use that money to buy food. He could use that money to buy a car at some point. There's almost nothing that he would want to use it for that he wouldn't be allowed to use it for. So I have one example where a church was, you know, the, the guardian of an individual and they asked if they could use the money to build themselves a gazebo. I said, that's not for the person. Right. That, that, <laughs> right. That's for you. Come on. That, I think that's the only time when somebody's asked me, have I said, I don't think so. I don't like that they're in charge of his money if they want to build a gazebo with his money. Um, yeah. oh, yes. So I, told them that. <laughs> I mean, it's a little like outside that's beyond the pale. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and at what age do we encourage people to start uh, an ABLE account today, no matter how old they are? I will say it is never a bad idea to save money on a tax advantage basis. However, at least as the law currently stands, you're able to move $16,000 a year from a traditional 529 into an ABLE account. So what if you don't have the 529? You just have from a savings account. So then most of the time we recommend if the individual is under 18, especially that they consider a traditional college savings account, a 529. In most states, there is a better tax deduction, or in many states, there's no tax deduction for ABLE, but you can get it for a traditional 529. Because they've been around longer, the fees are usually less expensive. Got it. So, and there's more options. So we usually recommend that people start with a traditional you know, 529 account, maybe if it gets closer to 15,000 or so, you know, then have a bit of a conversation. But if, you know, son or daughter is five years old and you want to start putting 500, you know, or dollars a year away, you should do a traditional uh, 529 college savings. And this is important information because I think a lot of us, when our kids were diagnosed, we're focusing on what we need to do now. And, and I don't think, I didn't know anybody who had a five-year-old that was like, oh, I, we need to be putting money away for college. Because I didn't know if that was even a possibility when my son was five. Um, but, but what I'm hearing you say, Andrew, is that you do the college fund anyway, because that money is protected and it's not going to be taxed. And then if you see that you need to move it to an ABLE account, you can move $16,000 a year to the ABLE account. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And, and your kid will need money. There's no doubt about it. Your child is going to need money. So um, what a great way to do it so that you're, you're not paying taxes on it as well. Now, now talk to us a little bit about special needs trusts. So a lot of, so once again, this is definitely something where um, 
we don't see a lot of special needs trusts open before an individual's 18, mostly because people don't get around to it because it's not a fun topic. Yeah. Um, there's also a few different ways to do it. A lot of people will ask, you know, should I consider enable or special needs trust? That's not an actual, that should never be a question. They're usually complement each other and they serve different purposes. Okay. The example I like to give is there's what's called first party and third party. It's always better to get somebody else to buy lunch. So it's always <laughs> better to use someone else's money. So a third party is <laughs> always better. So okay. first off, just remember that if you can take that away. And then okay. a trust that's in your will or a standalone trust. Um, one costs more. Generally, what we see is until the individual is 18, for example, uh, just having one in as part of their will. That means if something were to happen, the trust would be created later. Okay. Um, but that's that's much cheaper. But also when the individual is older, you may have more, you may know how you want to design the trust and who may want to be in charge versus you know, changing it all the time a little bit more might be set in stone. Um, and we definitely recommend they're outside the will, right? Especially if somebody's leaving um, a not insignificant amount of money or a house, et cetera. You know, you probably don't want a judge in a court who never knew your son creating the trust for you. It's better to put that down um, on paper yourself. Okay, now I'm confused because you were saying get a third. It's a better to have somebody else pay a third party, but now I hear you saying, but don't. There's two have... types of third party. Okay, explain it to me. So no, explain there's the one that's like in I... the will, and there's one that's its own separate standalone. So you could just okay. say that your will is going to make one, but it's okay. not actually made yet. But but this is a really important question because uh, what you know. It, eventually we're all not going to be here anymore. And I know people who've gone to great lengths and done a whole lot of things to make sure that their kid is okay. And then stuff happens. Like you were saying, the judge who doesn't know your kid, um, you know, even a relative that decides I want to build a gazebo, uh, a church who decides to, so what, what do you recommend for families when they're setting this up? Who do you leave in charge? Great question. Uh, so one of the most common things that we, we have a conversation that I would say many people don't have a conversation about is mm -hmm. don't put a sibling or a friend or a family member just because you feel you don't have any other options. There mm -hmm. are specialty trust companies that are designed to work with, you know, our, our population. And you can still have the, you know, the sister or the brother be what we call a, a trust protector, for example. They can still, you know, fire, hire, and, you know, be there as the sibling, but not take the role as the parent. When you think about how much you do as a parent, you know, on any given day and how many hours a week that takes, that's a big responsibility to put yeah. on another family member or friend. So we highly encourage people, you know, look into, you know, hiring somebody to do that. Yeah. Andrew, this is such good information. I don't know if you're familiar with, there's a book out right now that we really love here. It's called Free Marcus Cats. Um, and I, I'm going to imagine that the book you would love it and the book would, you would love it and the book would drive you crazy because the main character is a character who is a, a, a gentleman who is on the spectrum. He's in his twenties and his mom passes away and she thinks she's done right by him and it all goes bonkers. Um, and then, then it's, you know, this journey that he has to go on where he's escaped from the law. The law is looking for him and it's all because mom left a sibling in charge. Um, so, uh, we think it's a, a wonderful book, but I think it's raised the consciousness for a lot of us that, that just to, to do a trust isn't enough. We got to be mindful. We have to be working with people like you. There's so many other places where we say, you know what, get an expert. Don't guess. This is way too important. Get an expert. So Andrew, is, is your service available all across the United States? 
It is. Uh, our furthest client is in uh, Switzerland, actually. But mostly oh, so you're international. Okay. But guess, you can't, yes. Okay, because we have international clients here. So if somebody like me wants to work with you, how do we go about it? Go to our website, send us an email, and... And the uh-huh. email is planningacrossthespectrum.com? Correct. Yep. And my email is andrew at planningacrossthespectrum.com. There's a contact us on our website. So, okay. And then I imagine there's a consultation and, and you, you know, tell them, you know, what you think would be advantageous and what that will cost and how long it will take and all of those different things. Absolutely. But, we, we never charge anyone to answer some questions. If we can help them, great. Um, and we could let, and if they need more, we, we can let them know what that looks like. And I'm just guessing that it's very individual what people need, because depending on where you are in your life, where, you know, whether it's you that is the person on the spectrum or someone that you love on the spectrum. And, and, and as you said, what your goals are, what, what it is that you're working towards, what it is that you're trying to accomplish, it's all going to be different and require different things. Um, but Uh, Who better than Andrew and his team, somebody who knows this this conversation and is going to bring empathy and understanding of what some of the different hurdles are um, involved. Andrew, I just love this. This is amazing. Thank Thank you for this incredible service. And thank you for sharing all this important information with us. So again, you guys, it's planningacrossthespectrum.com. And you can write directly to Andrew at andrew at planningacrossthespectrum.com. We're going to have to have you back to talk about other things. And and I know at some point you said you would share that you've got another person in your uh, staff who specializes in the younger kids. So we might have to have them come and play with us at some point too. Uh, but p- when you have things coming up, will you just do me a favor and let us know, Andrew, because we'd love to have you back on. Sure. That would be great. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much for being with us again, you guys planning across the spectrum.com and you can write to Andrew at planning across the spectrum.com. Thank you for being with us, Andrew. Thank you. Bye bye, uh, and I, and I'm just gonna say to you guys because we're we're past time and I gotta run. Um, I'm gonna be back live with you on Tuesday, but we've got programming for you until then. Um, but uh, so please enjoy that programming. But the live shows will resume again on Tuesday until then. And don't forget next week it we're we're doing a live show on Tuesday. Ask Dr. Doreen. I don't know for sure what's happening on Wednesday, but it might be something special. So don't. Don't hold me to it. And then on Thursday, Moira Giamatteo is back for episode two of Let's Talk About the Movies. We've got more movies and TV shows to talk about with you on Thursday, that once a month show. But until then, give your kiddos a hug from me, one for you too. And don't forget, please go sign that petition. Uh, it's all over my Facebook. So uh, do me a favor. Please, please, please sign the petition. No one gets hurt if you sign a, position, uh, a petition. We would love to get a season two of As We See It. I appreciate you. Bye-bye. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.